The story of Rosie Ruiz is easily one of my favorite gems I pulled out of this topic. <laughs> So, the Boston Marathon, it's the world's oldest annual marathon run to date. With It's a foot race, it draws national attention, local attention, it's a big to-do. But cameras are there, people go from all over the world to compete, it's a hell of a thing. If you were sitting at the finish line of the Boston Marathon on April the 21st, 1980, you would have been uh, in for a treat. You would have witnessed the fastest woman alive cross that finish line and break records. Any sort of records in, in you know the Boston Marathon's history, records when it came to women running the marathon, you would have witnessed the grace and majesty of Rosie Ruiz, a complete wild horse coming out of nowhere to win the Boston Marathon in record time. She was only 26 years old and she finished First, baby, in just a pinch over two and a half hours. She comes uh, struggling uh, uh, into Copley Square at two hours, 31 minutes, and 56 seconds. And she comes in triumphant, waving to everyone. The officials place the, the, the Boston Marathon laurel crown on her head, and they give her the champion's medal, and they put her, put her, her name and her time in the record books. Rosie's time broke. Joan Benoit, one of the most famous female marathoners of all time, broke her record by three minutes and was the third fastest run ever by any woman on planet Earth. <laughs> history being made on an April morning in the Boston Marathon, right? One of the fastest women on the planet's existence had just crossed the finish line. And even more impressive, as they as they put the laurel crown on her forehead, she wasn't really all that sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> her hair was cut short, but it was neatly coiffed. Didn't really seem disheveled. Her face really wasn't all that flushed. She didn't seem all that breath. She had she had some sweat on her chest, but usually when you're running a marathon, your your, your shirt is sticking to you. Your sides are completely drenched. Uh, your 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 shorts are completely soaked all the way through from sweat running down your body for 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 like two hours of consistent pushing yourself to the absolute limit. Not a little, not a little sweat right here. We're talking like. Whoosh, a ton of sweat. Jackie Garreau, the favored woman in the entire race, the woman who a golf cart had been following her and she'd been in first the entire race in the golf cart with one of the, the original winners, Catherine Schweitzer, inside the golf cart reporting live. Oh, you're, you're, how is it? You're, 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 she's coming up. She's a clear contender. What do you mean somebody's already at the finish line? Jackie Garreau, who had been the favorite, who had been tracked throughout the race, was stunned to find that rather than first place, she was second to a new body, to somebody who had sprung up from nowhere. And naturally, in the face of such a startling defeat of expecting to be first, having a cart follow you, you being the pace person, and realizing that you're not first, you're second, and if you're not first, you're last, realizing that is a whole panorama of emotion, heartache, sadness, frustration. But that unsportsmanlike feeling of feeling a little bit of disbelief. And feeling disbelief's sister, suspicion, start to crawl at you at the finish line. These feelings creeped in. Really? How is this possible? Garo asked a reporter, can a woman improve from two hours and 56 minutes to two minutes and 31 seconds in one race? Rosie had said this was her second race ever in an interview. Her first race, she had finished just under three hours. And in her second race, she had magically chopped off 20 minutes off of her time. And she quotes, doubtfully, cynically, to a reporter, she must have had very good training. Little did Jackie know, the secret sauce was not training. It was not rookie luck. The secret sauce to Rosie Ruiz's success is that she had won using her signature strategy. <laughs> Don't actually run the full marathon. <laughs> <laughs> but who was this dark horse with the secret strategy to win a marathon in under two hours and a half? She was born in Cuba, 1953, arrived in Florida with her mom as a kid. She had already overcome a lot in 73. She'd had blackout headaches and periodic chills. She underwent surgery in Miami and they removed a tangerine sized tumor from her head. Five years later, they had to put a plastic skull, a plastic plate inside of her skull. And, and with all these challenges. She had moved from Florida to New York to get a new start. Part of that new life for herself was a new hobby, and that hobby happened to be marathon running. And so, after, and I quote, running around Central Park, 
She decided she was ready for the New York Marathon in 1979. On the form, she told them that she would be there in four hours and 10 minutes. A pretty standard time for someone just getting started into running. Is it a competitive time? Absolutely not. Is it even close to being a feasible time? Absolutely not. But finishing is a huge fucking accomplishment. I've never done it before and I've been running for a while. So she tells him, hey, I'll be there in four hours and 10 minutes. Expect me then. Um, and, and she goes off and does the marathon. Stunningly, she crosses the finish line, not in four hours and 10 minutes, but in two hours, 56 minutes and 29 seconds. She was the 11th woman in the entire field. This rookie on her first marathon miraculously finishes 11th in the entire field of women running the race that day. Nobody made a fuss except the folks in her office. You see, she worked for a, a metal trading company. Uh, it's New York, stock trading, precious metals. All of her office mates at Metal Traders Incorporated thought she was the bee's knees. Her boss was a jogger and her boss was so proud of her for finishing so strongly that she goes, he, that this boss goes, you gotta run the marathon. Rosie, I'll pay your way. You can run the Boston Marathon. It'll be fantastic. And so, her trip to Boston, her, her entry fee, all of it was paid for. Her time in New York was so good, it actually qualified her to run in Boston because Boston, the Boston Marathon was getting more popular during those days and they weren't just letting anybody in. I don't know what the entry fee was. I think it's, it gets a little dodgy I'm because the, it, there, there's entry fee now, which is you have to be raising money for charity and you have to qualify and all these other things. Um, back then, they were just beginning to change the rules. They had had a bit of a dodgy history with excluding women. She gets an entry, which means she takes somebody else's spot. Make sure you don't forget that. She's given the W50 sticker. She's the 50. Ranked the 50th ranked woman runner in the race. Her first race ever, she supposedly wins the damn thing. She will be the winner of the Boston Marathon for exactly eight days. <laughs> <laughs> and her undoing was the heavy media coverage the exact day of the race. You see, she was interviewed by Katherine Schweitzer, the first woman ever to officially compete in the Boston Marathon. And I want to talk about Katherine in a second here because her answers to Katherine's questions are laughable. The fact that she is bullshitting the, the first woman to ever officially run the marathon and to be bullshitting a woman that had to go and literally like be climbed and clawed at and pawed at and nearly tackled to the ground to finish makes it even worse. <laughs> So they ask her, hey, hey, how'd you do it, right? Like Catherine Schweitzer, one of the most legendary figures in women marathoning at the time, somebody who had contemporarily broken down barriers. It's it's Schweitzer, right? It's it's S-W-I-T-Z-E-R, Schweitzer. Thank you so much. It's Schweitzer. My apologies. That's on me. That's what happens when the documentaries you read don't have how to say her name. So anyway, Catherine Schweitzer is interviewing Mr. Weiss, right? And they ask her, hey, how are your intervals? Intervals are a crucial part of marathon training. It's kind of how you measure your progress. And they ask her, hey, what were your intervals? I mean, you've made incredible progress. You shaved 20 minutes off in between two races. What's your secret? Rosie says, and I quote, what's an interval? <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta talk about who Catherine Switzer is. This is Catherine. The Boston Marathon was a boys club and a boys club to the point where Switzer's coach, Arnie Briggs, insisted a marathon was too far for a fragile woman to run. He conceded, if any woman can do it, you could, but you have to prove it to me. If you run the distance in practice, I'll be the first to take you to Boston. Women were too fragile, must be Italian to run the thing. There had been one woman who had hidden in a bush and joined the competitors, but they, she had been like banned or whatever and been, been yelled at and all this other stuff. So Catherine wanted to legitimately run. There was no official rules barring her entry. The rules actually didn't say anything about gender. So she wanted to run the race. And, and so she she does a marathon. Her, her sexist coach finally decides to take her with him. And so there they're running, right? Switzer trained with them in 67 and she's going to compete under the number 261. She, again, she checked the rule book. There was no mention whatsoever of, of, of anything. She's running the race and one of the, the race officiants, this guy who looks like Rudy Giuliani behind her, Jock Simple, runs out on the course multiple times and tries to grab her number off of her and physically remove her from the course. In her memoir, she wrote, and I quote, instinctively, as I was running, I jerked my head around quickly and looked square into the most vicious face I have ever seen. A big man, a huge man with bare teeth was set to pounce. And before I could react, he grabbed my shoulder and flung me back screaming, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. <laughs> 
But Arnie Biggs, the coach who had doubted her and who had said, oh, it, you it, fragile woman can't run the race. He helped essentially like run point. They'll get off of her, get away from her. And another gentleman, her, her boyfriend, Tom Miller, a 235 pound ex-football player and a hammer thrower was also running. And he sees Rudy Giuliani one electric boogaloo come at his girlfriend again. And he just straight up tackles the dude. <laughs> He just straight up chat, tackles Jock Simple. It's like, get away from her. And Jock goes, when asked about it, he goes, the guy's a hammer thrower for cripe's sake. <laughs> <laughs> she finishes the race. They're all in a tizzy. I can't believe it. It's our race. The city of Boston is livid. The people who ran this race, Jock Simple um, and, and Will Cloney, the guy who runs this organization, they were beacons of the city. And now they're acting like spoil spoiled children because a woman ran the race. The, the, the support of the city was not behind them. Both of them will be removed from the organization, would, event, would no longer be allowed to have... You know, um, jurisdiction over the race because they tried to keep it a boys club and and it failed spectacularly thanks to her bravery one of the biggest reasons i want to mention is one rosie ruiz is lying to this woman's face a woman who had to run against being tackled groped and grabbed off the course and she has the audacity to lie to this woman about running a race so just keep this in mind the woman i'm going to show you interviewing her is a legend a modern day legend Right? Someone who broke all the rules and opened up women's marathoning in the Boston Marathon. It's just stunning. The amount of arrogance it takes to talk to someone like that and bullshit them to their face. But before we move away, one of the people who was fired, the leader of the, of the athletic association that oversaw the Boston Marathon, had this to say, and I quote, Women can't run in the marathon because the rules forbid it. Unless we have rules, society will be in chaos. This is a 26-year-old woman he's about to talk about in this way, so be, please be seated. I don't make the rules, but I try to carry them out. We have no space in the marathon for any unauthorized person, even a man. If that girl were my daughter, I would spank her. <laughs> So Miss Switzer had to deal with a whole heaping load of BS, um, only to be lied to by Rosie Ruiz at the finish line. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough, everyone in the race, all the organizers, uh, realized, hey, we're at one of the most photographed sporting events on the East Coast. Let's check all the photos. Let's check all the photos of the entire race. Let's talk to all the journalists, have them submit all the photographs. Let's take a look at all the press people, have them submit all the photographs. And you know what? Let's see if we can find her. If she really ran the race, we'll be able to see her in the background of all these photos. And stunningly, she's not in any of the photographs until the last half mile. Wow. Um, amazing. Finally, spectators came forward and said they saw her push her way through the crowd and join the race a mile from the finish. Once they were done talking about spanking people uh, and they realized that Rosie had essentially cheated and run a fraction of the race and claimed the victory, they did a little extra digging. Sometimes the real scoop is found two or three layers down. If she did it here in Boston, what if she did it in New York to qualify? So they do some digging at the New York Marathon and the New York Marathon officials, they go through their photographs. Again, there's no pictures of her even crossing the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> the running belief is that she walked around in the space behind the finish line with the number on. Someone took her number and asked her what her time was. We definitely don't know that she ran it though. Someone saw her on the New York subway system. She insisted, oh, they're just bullying. I finished the New York race. They're just, I'm just being persecuted by meanies. Susan Morrow came forward and, and said, I saw her back in October on a train from Greenwich Village to Columbus Circle. She was wearing a running suit and a marathon number. She said she had turned her ankle and just wanted to watch the race end. But she had then busted through the crowd and claimed victory. The full story came out. Rosie was disqualified from the race. Eight days afterward, Miss Garo was brought back from Canada and was given her official uh, ribbon and the laurel wreath and the medal. They have a makeshift victory, app, uh, like uh, a celebration for the real winner. And since then, Rosie has left her mark on racing, whether she wanted to or not. The phrase, doing a Rosie, is still runner's slang for cheating and cutting a course. <laughs>
If you're in Boston on Marathon Day and you pass by Kenmore Square Bar, you'll see a sign in the window that says, and I quote, Rosie Ruiz started here. <laughs> <laughs> there were t-shirts with a subway token and the Rosie Ruiz track club that did really good business for a while. And I have aware of it now that the two idiots from the Catherine story, they were both kicked out of the Boston Athletic Association and the times changed because the old fogies were gone. So you know, it's kind of one of those things. They were relevant when they were younger and running the race, but times change and, and if they don't want to change with them, the race is going to change without them. Rosie refused to give up her medal. In spite of the incredible, overwhelming evidence, they had to print a new medal for, for Miss Garot, for Jacqueline, because Rosie just refused to give up her old one. She's gonna keep it, I'm taking it with me. And it's probably a good thing that she did because a couple years afterward, her life kind of fell into free fall and she probably needed something to pawn. She was charged with writing bad checks. Her arrest record shows that she was on probation for grand larceny for forgery, for cocaine dealing. Slowly and surely though, her record fell off. Uh, her obituary states uh, that she withdrew from public life, that she, you know, got married, you know, had three sons and, and had a job and worked as a notary public down in Florida, did some real estate work down in Florida. That's it. Meanwhile, by the way, the Boston Marathon did learn their lesson. Marathon organizers have made it officially harder for anyone to follow in her footsteps after a couple tried to be the first, tried to finish first in the senior citizen category in 1997, but they were able to find, they had checked out on the computer, but they were caught by secret cameras had been placed throughout the course. The Boston Marathon to crack down on cheaters now has secret gotcha zones. They don't tell you where these gotcha zones are, but there's secret photos all throughout the course to make sure that everyone runs it and everyone can be tracked the entire time. What if I told you that her interview at the finish line with Catherine uh, uh, was recorded? Let's take a look. W22, Jacqueline Garreau, number one Canadian runner, at least Canadian in residence. Jacqueline Garreau's best time is 2.39.06, which she ran in the New York City Marathon. They probably will start doing that now pretty soon if they aren't already. And now coming toward the finish, the first woman. <laughs> On the right, Rosie Ruiz from New York. A shocker. Ah, good point, Lori. Good point for those who said it. Including you, Barbarian. Nobody has thought about her when the race has begun. A total stranger to the experts, Rosie Ruiz. It was a fantastic race. I really entered it to finish. I didn't enter to praise myself <laughs> for second or third or anything else. Uh, it is my second marathon. And um, what, was, what was the time in your first ever marathon, and where was it? It was 2 hours and 56 minutes and 33 seconds in New York last year. <laughs> in the New York City Marathon last October? Yes. And so you improved from two, 2 hours and 56 minutes to 2 hours and 31 minutes. <laughs> like I said, I've trained myself. Um, I enjoy running very much. I enjoy long distance running. Um, I was running when I was in high school and... The I fake stagger for me, baby. And lately, I have been training very hard. Oh. Rosie, oh. what, kind of, um, what kind of training have you been doing? You say 65 to 70 miles a week. Have you been doing a lot of heavy intervals? Um, someone else asked me that. I'm not sure what intervals are. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, intervals are, are track workouts that are designed Whoops. to make your speed improve dramatically. And if you went from a 256 to a 231, one would normally expect that you do a <laughs> lot of speed. Serious, welcome on in. Is, is someone coaching you or advising you? Uh, no, I advise myself. <laughs> That's about it. Do you, do you run for the? Are very supportive and. Uh, do you run for the New York Roadrunners Club? I am not a member of the Roadrunners Club. Do you, do you live in Manhattan? Yes, I do. And how old are you? Twenty-six. And um, this is your second ever marathon. So, what, what about <laughs> any of your past races? Do you hold any other records or uh, performances? This is my second race. Like I said, my first one was in New York, and I came in twenty-third in the women's and six hundred twenty-one overall. <laughs> and I uh, didn't think I was really going to do this good here. really didn't. Well, it was a fantastic performance, Rosie. Congratulations. Rosie Ruiz, the mystery woman winner. <laughs> we missed her at all our checkpoints. She came through the finish in a fantastic 231. We have to confirm that time. Oh, sorry. It's not Class YouTube. here today in the Boston Marathon. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. I 
just love it. She's so polite, but the shade that this mighty oak is casting down is is incredible. I missed yet at all the checkpoints. Still have to confirm everything. <laughs> So that's the story of our first cheater. It's a good, it's a good palate cleanser. It's just a good like warm up, something to get you started with. Now we gotta kind of dive into something a bit heavier.